a little weird to us today. They were actually quite common in English churches dating back as far as the 16th century. While they had many designs and purposes, the main one was to shut off wealth and social status, because where you sat in church reflected where you stood in society. Now, from 1723 until 1912, Old Lord was a closed congregation. What that means is you couldn't just walk in and sit wherever you'd like, like you just did today. You actually had to purchase your pew from the church, and that would be your assigned seat on Sunday. You didn't own a pew, you didn't come to church here. Many benefits only a few aside just from getting access to church on Sundays, many one being that uh, you can decorate it any way you like. People would bring in fabric wall coverings, carpeting, seat cushions, furniture from home, uh, kneelers, foot warmers, blankets, anything to make the worship experience more comfortable and more fashionable. It would have been a lot more colorful in here as a result because every single pew would have been decorated a little bit differently. However, since 1912, Old Lord has been an open congregation, and when folks come here for church on Sundays now, they sit wherever they like. But of course, it's not our seating arrangement that makes us so famous. The famous for the events of the night of April 18, 1775. So on that day, Boston was under British occupation by an army of 4,500 troops, under the direction of General Thomas Gage, the royal governor of Massachusetts, and the owner of pew number 62 in the back corner of this church. Now, for months, Gage had been sending troops out into the countryside to search for and capture arms and ammunition being stockpiled by the colonists. One particularly large stockpile was held at town hall Concord, some 20 miles northwest of Boston. Gage decided to send out two regiments, roughly 700 men, to march out to Concord, capture the ammunition, and end all hopes of an armed conflict. Well, unfortunately for General Gage, his secret plans were discovered by the Patriots Spire, one of the Sons of Liberty, who quickly had their own plan to counteract. They would send their two best riders out ahead of the British Army. William Dawes and Paul Revere. Revere and Dawes were not to ride all the way to Concord where the British were headed, but instead would stop halfway in the town of Lexington. There they were born two leaders of the rebellion, John Hancock and Samuel Adams. For Revere and Dawes, there was two men, and fear being caught was great. With this military occupation came military curfew, which restricted when people could leave their homes. So Revere devised a backup plan to make sure that his message would leave Boston even if he could. Revere enlisted the help of over 30 additional riders. He placed them across the river in Charlestown and ordered their leaders to look at the steeple of Old Lord Church every night for signal landings, the number of which indicated when the British would leave Boston and by which route. One night lantern the steeple meant the British would march over the Boston Neck, a narrow strip of land and the only road connecting the town to the mainland, which would take a considerable amount of time. Two lit lanterns in the steeple meant the British would take a shortcut by rowing boats across the Charles River in the Canyon, substantially cutting down the river. That's when we get the famous line from Longwell's poem, What If I Land? <laughs> so when the British Navy put boats in the water that night, the colonists knew which way they were intending to leave. Revere had two men come to the church that night. One was a sexton of the church caretaker, Robert Newman. The other was a vestment of the church and a friend of Revere's named Captain John Blunt Jr. The two men came inside the same front door you did with the lock behind them. They then climbed up one of these two staircases in the back corner, up into the second floor gallery, where they squeezed behind the pipe organ and climbed a series of stairs and ladders eight stories high in complete darkness. Once they reached the top, they lit the two lanterns and held them out the window toward Charlestown for just 60 seconds. Now that might not seem like such a long time, but it's all the time that was needed. <clears throat> By the time Revere himself arrived in Charlestown over an hour later, he was told the message had been received and men were already arriving. He would borrow a horse and start his own ride with men. That night, the message had spread as far north as New Hampshire and as far, excuse me, as far south as Connecticut. So on that next morning, April 19, 1775, when the 700 British troops arrived in Lexington, they didn't find the sleeping village they had hoped. Instead, they found an armed and waiting militia. The shots fired that morning were considered the first of the American Revolution. That's one of the small and significant role the opening hours of our war of independence, and it's our most famous night thanks to Longfellow. Of course, church post almost 300 years of history beyond what happened here that one night. If you take a look behind you, upstairs, just below our typeboard, you can see our wooden clock. It's 
Fox Ranch is made by two foresters here, Mr. Avery and Mr. Bennett. And these two gentlemen uh, were not clock makers. They had never made a clock before they made this one, and they would never make another one. That's the one and only clock they ever tried to make, but they must have really done something right, because it's been up on that wall since 1726, almost 300 years old, but still keeps accurate time today. You can check your watch or your phone. We wind weekly, and I don't think you'll find an older uh, working clock on this flight. Now, another object of interest is one you all sort of have since you walked in. It's down at the end of our center aisle. It's a wooden box covered in plexiglass. If you pass by on the way out, you'll see CC carved in the cover for Christ Church and the date 1724. That box is this church's original document holder and donation box. It's almost 300 years old, but the most interesting thing about it is that it still works today, and I encourage you to test it out. <laughs> in all seriousness, uh, if you haven't donated it already, we really appreciate it. Uh, the only reason I came in here or that the church is even open at all is the people who sat where you're sitting have donated before. Um, the church, I know it looks good today, but we actually haven't had a renovation of this church since 1912. We're long overdue. We're turning 300 in 2023, and we'd like to uh, renovate before then. So every dollar counts, and again, we greatly appreciate it. You can also support us by going to the store of our gift shop and checking out some of the stuff we have in there. If you have any more questions about the history of the church, I'll be out here. My name is Will. My co-presenter on the front. Thank you. Enjoy your time in Boston.